Yeah. Hopefully my connection will be a bit better from now on because I changed computers. So I don't need to use one of those USB Wi-Fi things that is so crappy. Hopefully it's better. Uh, I don't know how we should do this today, though. I mean, we never stop to read something together. Yeah, did we want to read passages or just discuss the text? Because I, I did read the chapter you sent um, b beforehand. You read the chapter, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm imagining we're actually going to discuss the, the the actual content of the text, right? Not like some general presentation thing, right? Yeah, I'm just opening it now. Yeah, me too. Yeah, maybe you should share your screen and uh, have a text, have the uh, text idea. open. Good idea. Just one second. I initially read the other uh, technology book. Do you know what's what the difference? Because it's, it's kind of the same text, but with many small. Yeah, just share the screen here. The the is different it, from what I know is that the the technology book was actually meant to be three books, and apparently in Russian you actually have the three books. So there is another file. I think we have it also on. Our, There is this other one that I, I know it's not this one. Yeah, there is an, another te a text called uh, Technology, Book One, yeah. which I think is just a bit more detailed because it's it's not a summary. It's it it was pu it was published before, but he didn't make it shorter to fit everything in one book. So sometimes it's a bit longer. And I think there is something in that book that it's not in this one. Let me just check again here on the, uh, where is the summary? Yeah, in this version here, there is a lot of stuff missing that is actually quite interesting, but I don't think I, I have it. I have the other book here for some reason. Uh, Uh, it should be here, but yeah, I don't remember. I don't have the other version, but if you look in the in the summary, it has some other kind of specific uh, discussions that are very, very interesting, especially one that I think is particularly interesting. I don't think it's in this book yet, which is at the end of the book, there is an appendix called uh, the, or uh, the Organization of Labor or something like this, where he, 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 he applies everything to a sort of redescription of the labor process and how energy consumption and, 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 and labor are connected. And he makes some weird calculus of how many calories a worker needs and how they, how, like he tries to substitute mon monetary discussion of circulation with the energetic discussion where Things that should circulate in society are quantified in terms of amounts of calories that you can actually consume and things like this. It's, it's pretty amazing and weird, which I think is actually a good way to des describe him in general. Like I, I mentioned in the group, one thing that really I never really stopped to realize, but I think this guy is the only. Soviet Marxist I know of 
that actually died because of stuff that he actually did, not like got killed by Stalin, committed suicide. He actually, I mean, he he died for, for different reasons. So the only kind of figure in late twenties that I could think of in that situation. Uh, okay, let me just do something here. And it was a really crazy way, right? It was with a trans blood transfusion. Yes, he created an institute to study blood transfusion. And then he did a blood transfusion between him and a guy with meningitis <laughs> and to see wow. if his dream, his, his blood would cure the other person. And no, that didn't happen. So that's how he died. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, he was looking for like immortality or something. One of those cosmist projects in, in Russian uh, philosophy. I read that the other guy was actually, um, he got better. It was, it was Bogdanov that died. No way, really? <laughs> yeah, because the other guy got Bogdanov's blood and apparently Bogdanov had been getting like people were commenting on how much younger and healthier he looked from the other transfusions. Mm -hmm. So then he gave his blood to this guy who was like a student um, and he got better, but Bogdanov got the infected blood and it killed him. And there's also speculation that uh, it might've been wrong blood types because they didn't understand that at the time. I see. Yeah, the guy, I mean, I really recommend, there is a new biography out called Red Hamlet. Uh, I think I have the PDF uh, somewhere. I, I can upload it. I, I don't have it here with me because I just changed computers, but I will upload it later on. But it's this one here by James White. For some reason, these are the nice pictures, but uh, it came out through Brill. It's really, really good. It's a bit, uh, like I, I was a bit, a bit uh, frustrated with it because they say they're going to, give a sort of intellectual history of his project and you don't really get that. Uh, there's not a, like a really serious engagement with what he was doing, but it's, uh, it's a really, really good kind of overview of his, whole, his life and different moments in his life. Uh, there is another book, which I think is really good called Beyond Marx and Mach, uh, which is also, it's a more detailed analysis of uh, Bogdanov's work. Uh, I was reading it today. It's, it's. I mean, again, it's not something that you say whoa, but it's uh, very useful and more detailed, especially on that point. Like the book criticizes that Bogdanov was kind of established as that guy that was not Lenin, and the guy Lenin was arguing with, and there isn't very much of a sort of imminent or intrinsic approach to what he did. And uh, so the book tries to do a bit of that, tries to show exactly where he's breaking with kind of Soviet early philosophy, how is his position different and in a less caricatured way, but it's still, uh, I mean, I still think that for better or worse, because it it was a very kind of tendentious presentation. The way that uh, Mackenzie Warp talks about Bogdanov in her book, Molecular Red, she sees, she discusses four theorists, right? Bogdanov, Platonov, then Kim Stanley Robson and Donna Haraway. And it's a sort of, a, the whole project is more contemporary and more, more driven by contemporary politics. So, Anthropocene and things like this. And she really suggests that Bogdanov has something to add. And But it's interesting that uh, even though I think it's the most creative use of his philosophy, most, let's say, fresh, there is one very specific point that anyone who gets, who reads her work will see that is curious, which is uh, in one of his books, I think in this one called Philosophy of uh, Living Experience, which was written in uh, 1910. Uh, so it's a bit before technology. Uh, he talks about the labor point of view. 
he, he gives a definition of, of nature that is dependent on the idea of labor, which is actually a, for people who like Lacan and those things, it's very telling. He defines nature as what resists labor. Uh, and says that's why you only learn about the natural world through labor, because and labor very broadly defined, because what counts as nature is precisely that which resists having a, some other organization imposed onto it. And so there is this idea of the labor point of view, which is looking for that resistance. But later on, he develops the thing that we're actually reading, which is the organizational point of view, which is not exactly the same as that previous thing. So it's curious that in her work, she focuses on this idea of the labor point of view. She uses this to say that we should return to a more vulgar image of Marxism, of labor versus the world, labor versus capital, and that this, this image, which is kind of, uh, looks simplistic but it's actually very sophisticated it's just not academic that's her kind of her argument i think it's actually quite a good argument but uh she uses bogdanov in that that idea that that there is a sort of labor point of view and it's slightly different i think from what is in this in this book uh like uh i think that this this very early point that this unity of the organizational point of view and this first point here, it already kind of gives an idea of why we shouldn't really mix labor and organization or treat both as the same thing, you know? Uh, so I think that's, that's one important point. But I definitely recommend her work as well. I think it's, it's very useful as a starting point to into like why this stuff is relevant. Uh, can you put the name of the book in the in the chat window? Uh, of course, just one second. I actually need to separate the chat window so I can actually comment on it. It's uh, Molecular Red by Mackenzie work so about 60 pages are dedicated to Bogdanov then there is this book called beyond math and Marx I think I forget the name of the author and the, and the biography is called red Hamlet there are some interesting papers as well we, we even have them uh, uh, on I don't know why this doesn't but anyway uh, there are some, some good papers on Bogdanov. There is a short one for people in, uh, from Brazil. There is a short one in Portuguese that is quite good. And there is, there is the, this guy who, who translated it, George Gorelick. He wrote a couple of texts. Uh, I think we have them on our, on our, our, res, our PDF. Um, I think this one here, which is not very well argued. It's, it's a very short text. It's not like going into anything profound, but it's a kind of defense of why there's stuff in what he's doing in the idea of technology, which is neither in general systems theory nor in cybernetics. So he suggests that there is a sort of reduction of the project in the way that it was carried out both in, in late Soviet engagement with systems theory and cybernetics and in Western uh, versions of these things. So it's nice that he, he gives this sort of defense that there is something worth looking and that it's not just a matter of historical uh, approach, you know, just look at what, what was done, but it's not very clear where the distinctions are. Like sometimes he, he says, well, Bogdanov pretty much was the first to consider the idea of an environment, uh, not only of a system. Then there, there are some other precisions he makes about, uh, because th these are two concepts that he's supposedly the precursor of. The idea of feedback, 
because you have the idea of control and controllers and regulators in this project already and the idea of environment which you'll find later on in system theory and, and ecological thinking which you can also find in this book already but i mean it's what i think Gor uh, what garlic doesn't really focus on that much is uh I'm not sure if that, that's the big difference, but there is a such a weird uh, kind of it, you're, it's such a strong point of view, in my opinion, concerning this idea that there are only organizational problems, right? Uh, and and he accepts to treat so, so such diverse things in terms of this specific perspective. That I think it it goes very much beyond what systems theory wants to consider, like is ready to consider as a as a system. So I don't know. I I, it, I it's hard to pinpoint exactly, but I I think it's not just a matter of uh, he thought he thought this first or that he, he attached this idea of regulation, environment, and systems together very early on. But there, there does seem to be something slightly different. And I think that it also concerns politics. I mean, the, the political aspects of cybernetics and systems theory, I think it's, it's not really in the forefront in any way. And I think that here it, it's connected to it. I mean, I'm not sure what you guys thought of this first chapter, but my impression is that, I mean, there is this very strong theoretical de defense in the beginning of what what is organization as a point of view and so on. But then it's a long kind of story about the vision of labor, specialization in knowledge, and how you need a new culture to both accept specialization and go beyond it, right? Uh, so the justification for a general theory of organization is not really uh, scientific in the pure sense of this is the problem we need to solve it, because for the because from the very principles that he puts forward, that organization of production comes before or conditions the organization of ideas, the very classic Marxist theme, there is no point in trying to solve something if there isn't, let's say, a real world kind of instantiation of that problem prior to it, right? Which for him is connected with the, the actual life or the, the actual proletarian experience in Soviet Russia, right? Uh, I think it's it's perhaps worth mentioning before we begin for people who didn't really take a look in, in to his very crazy biography that uh, Bogdanov started like he he was a, a physician with specialization in psychology then he turned into Marxism still in the in the 19th century uh, then he wrote what became the like the, the standard textbook for social democrat and Marxist political economy, like two books that were re-edited for I don't know, 30, 40 years. So he was seen as a sort of big specialist on political economy, especially a kind of a didactic teacher of Marxist political economy. Then between 1905 and 1915, so the years where the revolution was really on, on the sort of the forefront. Besides a bunch of other texts he was writing, uh, he started working on this kind of approach to, to, to organization and science and a sort of critique of philosophy, which is also implied in, in, in this book. Uh, and it's the thing that actually got him ideologically is the thing that got him at, to be at odds with Lenin, even though for a long time, they had a truce, like they agreed to not talk about this. So even though they were pretty much the two main leaders of the Bolshevik party, this sort of divisions at the level of philosophy and so on, they really didn't come into play. 
until the moment where it seems like Bogdanov was gaining very high influence and he was kind of the leader of the more extreme left part of the, the Bolsheviks. And I think that it, it's very much connected with what he's proposing here because, uh, I mean, I'm not sure if we're jumping too much, but I, I find this last paragraph here very telling uh, of where he's coming from. This is the very end of the, of this chapter, when he says, oh my God. where is it? He says that there are two, yeah, that there are two, uh, two things that that jolt into the realization and shaping of the general organization of point of view, right? The world war, the first world war in the case and the Soviet revolution. And I find it interesting because he calls the, the world war, the school of organization, right? Uh, so it's actually the, the, let's say the war taught people about the importance of this organizational point of view but then the, the sort of great organizational crisis is connected with the revolution, which forced the working class to organize hastily and intensively, not only its own efforts, uh, but to take over the organization of social life as a whole. And I like this because rather than calling the revolution a sort of solution to a problem, right? He calls it a crisis in the sense that during the, the the revolution forced people to deal with problems of organization that they never had to deal with before. Rather than saying that finally we will put our ideas into play, the problem is actually that the revolution brought problems in, into view that they didn't, they hadn't thought before. And I think that this is very important to understand his general position and the reason why this book was polemic and Lenin tried to bury it in a sense, uh, because he had this idea of the proletariat, right? And a lot of time and energy in his life actually went into trying to experiment with this, but it was pretty much the idea that, which it's a sort of kind of theory of cultural revolution, right? That together with taking the means of production or bringing down the state or whatever, you had to develop sort of cultural uh, situation in which certain problems could be pos po po positively formulated and uh, people could actually appropriate themselves for, from the situation, right? So you can see that he was a bit reactive, for example, in 1917 to the way that the, the constitution of the Soviets happened and the way that the, the, the government was established because he was constantly saying that there were, which is, it's, I find it ambiguous because it's also a bit perhaps uh, optimistic, you know, like, oh, if we just create the culture, then things will have, like, people will deal better with the situation or be, it will be more adequate for people to work through the, the, the new challenges. But at the same time, I think his pessimism uh, concerning what would happen without such a proletarian culture, in a sense, was confirmed because he never treated culture in terms of kind of awareness. Culture is for him very much, or at least from what I understood this far, uh, this sort of space of how to transfer methods and where will you learn, where if you can or cannot extract the means to learn how to do new things, right? Uh, and he very clearly says that the, there is a sort of new situation with industrial capitalism uh, that creates this tension between specialization on the one hand that's connected to the social division of labor and on the other hand, the sort of universal or seemingly universal experience of the proletariat that is required to never be fully specialized in anything 
to be kind of polymorphous in some sense. And he says, well, there is there is a sort of nascent nascent cultural kind of a new culture of knowledge there that we need to develop if society is not going to kind of ultimately resort to the same social technologies, right? So I think that culture should be understood probably in this sense, like what is available in terms of ways of, of kind of coming up with solutions or, or, or organizational experiments so that, for example, you might resort to a new structure rather than just resort to a leader or to some very hierarchical system, not because you're manipulated or, or because it's ideologically uh, overdetermined, but simply because we don't know how to do some things differently, right? Yeah, on that topic, I, I thought it was interesting that he brought up technology as um, kind of a catalyst for this uh, like reawakening of organizational science because he he mentions like the relationship of the laborer to the machine and how it starts off as the laborer is just kind of an appendage to the machine. It trying to, you know, maintain it. Um, but then at some point, the laborer starts to organize the machines. And I think, although this is, the text is pre-Turing, there seems to be that like a current there of like, once the machine becomes, um, the, the, the more general the machine becomes, um, the more different uh, fields have to come together for the, for the labor in order to carry out tasks with the machine. I thought this, this statement was very Turing-like. Yeah. An organizer of a universal type. Sounds like exactly. it can run any program, right? Exactly, yeah. It, it seems to be a precursor to Turing. Yeah, and I that mean, makes sense. I mean, yeah, like like teaching machines what to do like as machines become more complex you you need to be able to take ideas from different domains to and implement them in a common language a common uh, uh kind of way of specifying these different laboring uh, labors right yeah yeah i think that this is i mean just before i mean the the, the I have a particular problem, especially I think I, I managed to anticipate some of the issues due to what we discussed last time because of uh, this universality that I think he suggests that the proletarian, the early 20th century proletariat would already achieve. I think the 20th century showed that it's not that easy, right? I mean, uh, there is seems to be something to this I mean, the, the little story, I mean, I, I do think we should cover in more detail the stuff, but the basic story that he covers in, in, the, in point three, right, called the path to the organizational science, he begins with a description of primitive and religious thought. Uh, and with this idea that, uh, that there is a sort of basic meta, metaphorical use of of words that allow you to transfer, let's say, basic practical experience from one action onto other fields. And he tries to kind of account for uh, the birth of religion, basically from the spirit of commands, right? The idea of commanding somebody. It, and it's actually very interesting because he says it's, it's because one, the organizer commands the organized commands them to do something, bosses them around, that you then generalize this to the idea that things are caused in nature through the same principle. So there, therefore, there must be some commander behind causation, right? Uh, it's actually, the whole, the whole chapter for me seems to be about the sort of lateral transfer of methods 
which he talks about a lot. So for example, he will also talk about uh, later on in this little story, he talks about popular technology and how popular sayings have that structure of just giving you a sort of cause and consequence structure with no particular content, right? Like, I don't, I'm not sure if you have that expression in English, like, English, like don't go in the rain if you don't want to get wet. No, uh, it's not about rain and getting wet. It's just a sort of connection between cause and effect that applies to everything, right? So there is, there is a lot of this sort of expansion of our capacity to act that goes beyond the limit, for example, of social action. So people relating to people from that sort of experience, you get structures that now we apply to people's relation to nature, for example, or to the description of nature's relation to itself. So there's a sort of transfer of, of the way we organize things, but there's also what he calls generalization, right? Because it's not, it's not like you can control this automatically. So usually these things get kind of out of hand and they're supposed to cover everything. And then there's the inverse movement of specialization, uh, which is a sort of increased capacity for, for cognition and development of knowledge and so on. He talks about it by talking, saying that it creates a greater economy of effort because you learn how things are, are organized in specific restricted ways. But on the other hand, this also comes with a sort of big sort of equivocal problem at the level of language and science and philosophy, because you have many words or concepts to describe the same thing, then the same concept to describe very different things and nothing matches anything. And it's it gets so complex that you can't really kind of bind it all together with a pre modern worldview, right? So there is this weird kind of tension between generalization and and specialization, right? Of learning how something works or engaging with something on its own terms and then applying what you learn there to everything or to more things, right? And having to, to restrict or criticize your own deployment of these terms when they go too, too far and actually, rather than enlighten you about something, get in the way of you actually learning about it. And it seems like at the end of this whole story, right, we are at a sort of, it's, it actually reads a lot like the Apolito. Apolito mentions this text about scale thresholds and information thresholds. And there is something similar here because the more specialization allows you to to increase the specifications and the detailing of your of different fields of knowledge, the less it is possible to combine them all on a one synthetic worldview, right? And so there seems to be a sort of shift, a sort of break between the period where philosophy was still something like natural philosophy. It could philosophers in compass and they studied all fields of knowledge and there, there was like every book had a bit of morals, a bit of natural uh, physics, a bit of um, aesthetics and so on. And philosophy gave you a sort of systematized version of all of that. Then you get a sort of break in modernity where every domain of knowledge starts developing uh, uh, in radical autonomy and going to a greater and greater detail and uh, this is kind of mirrored by the specialization in, in labor and so on. And he suggests that the sort of communist perspective in all of this needs to combine both, right? You can't go back to, to that sort of classic philosophical system, but you still need to ask what does it mean to systematize this big mess, right? Because the sort of cultural correlate of the uh, how do you call it a uh, kind of overcoming of the division of labor will have to be an overcoming of the theory of knowledge that is that goes with the division of labor but if we know that it cannot be 
a return to a sort of one worldview system because that doesn't make any sense. So I think that he stops this, this chapter kind of stops there with a sort of the time has come for this because of the proletariat, right? And because the conditions for seeing that there is something common to every, di every different specialized labor is already here. But I think the 20th century actually proved that we didn't see the end of, of specialization and we didn't see the end of uh, the sort of disqualification of the laborer in front of machinery and other things or the, the sort of actual imbrication between industrial capital organization of labor and the heterogeneity of social conditions, right? Uh, so I wonder if the, this kind of like Bogdanov looking at the way laborers are and workers are organized around certain uh, jobs and tasks and the sort of optimism that well, once they start circulating in a society that, in a socialist society, it becomes clear that even though the material they're working on is different, and because of it being different, uh, it, it structures both work and knowledge in different ways, still there is something common to all of these tasks and all of these fields, which is the fact that they're all organized in some way or another, right? So. Last time we were talking about this idea of social homogeneity as a sort of uh, unthought presupposition of a lot of leftist political theory. And even though I think that he's, he theorizes about this sort of conflict between organizational spaces and so on, uh, I wonder if this conclusion about the, the terrain being, you know, a good a good moment for for approaching this sort of universal perspective in a because of the needs of the times if it was really you know so if it really was that possible uh so that end there i'm a bit skeptical about it you know when he talks about well the worker was a pendant like it's it's just overviewing the machine therefore he's looking at the way something is structured, kind of from the outside, almost like an observer from it. And he is at the same time capable of doing that for many machines, therefore, for many different ways of, of transforming the world. So he's becoming this polymorphous uh, uh, subject. And yeah, that didn't happen, right? So uh, I wonder how, what sort of change that must be made for this to to be corrected or considered that the 20th century didn't really show this sort of optimism concerning the instruction of a new culture just through the sort of circulation of labor and rotation of positions due to things like unemployment and things like this they don't really make people more capable for some reason of yeah I think the, the biggest gap in this first chapter i think is he doesn't address capital as a rival organizational science right isn't capital also the thing that can cross all specializations and, and you know like uh, abstract think, labor yeah, is, I mean, is exactly that right yeah but i don't think that he he should put it as an as a, as a i mean on this point i think it's very similar to things we've been talking about because I don't think that he does, I mean, to begin, this chapter is way too general to actually, I think, make use of that concept. But at the same time, uh, he, he, for example, in this passage here, right, uh, he says, uh, yeah, he gives us this tree. I wanted to talk about this, the word social norm, ideas and social norms. Then he says this thing here, ultimately, I mean, this for me is the big kind of axiom behind this chapter. 
that the concept of organiz organizing action is hidden in the term production. And he changes Engel's term from production of people, things, and ideas to organization of external forces, organization of human forces, and organization of experience uh, as a different way of saying the same thing. Uh, but then he says this here, right? Uh, that don't we also see everywhere destructive activities in disorganizing problems? Yes, but this is a particular instance of the same tendency. If society classes and groups collide destructively, disorganizing each other, they do so precisely because each collective, aim, collective aims at an organization of the world and of mankind for itself, according to its own ideals. This is the result of the separateness and isolation of organizational forces, the result of a lack of their unit in common harmonious organization. So it's a struggle of organizational forms. I think capital will appear inside here as just one of these things, right? I mean, in this sense, I think it's similar to, to our idea of how do you turn capitalism into something very large, but which is not everything? Uh, and how do you, how do you kind of turn the theory of organization into something that includes political economy, perhaps, in, instead of just saying organization is something totally different from economical structure. I think that's, that's kind of what he's aiming at here, right? It's a, a bit weird and it's a bit corny, uh, uh, but I think that that's kind of where it would go into, right? Uh, I think yes. that it takes him a while to get into economy in this book because I think he actually is treating something so, so much bigger, right? Uh, like he wants the things he's talking about to apply to, I don't know, discussing a raindrop, discussing how workers get together, discussing how stars collide. I mean, he wants it to be very general. So, uh, but... I, but I agree. I don't think he has the most sophisticated theory of capitalism, to be honest. Like, yeah, it seems like our approach is to take this to, as, like Bogdanov lays out why capital can uh, organize things because there's something already uh, general underlying different forms of organization, right? Yeah. And, and it's, it's just a, like a poor, it's a poor coordinating mechanism, but the fact that it can be coordinated was, is it's something else. It's yeah. a different, there's already something, a precondition for capital here. Yeah. And he does a, something very similar to, to Marx when he's talking about, let me just see if I can find it. Uh, when, in point three, right. When he's giving this little history, uh, he talks about actually this page here. I the guy who's he's quoting for this whole thing about uh, the vagueness of primitive words. I mean that's almost the title of a Freud's text, the antithetical meaning of primitive words. And uh, Freud was talking about a linguist called uh, Carl Abel, and he's talking about like he was a guy who really influenced Bogdanov. It's called um, what's the guy's name for fuck's sake? Uh, I'm just thinking about it. Yeah, I think it's called uh, Ludwig Noahe. Uh, he had a very famous book on the origin of language that connected language, the, the emergence of language with work and actions and uh and i know from from bogdanov's biography that this was like one of his biggest influences ever so it's kind of interesting to see him here deba debating this use of of metaphors and language and so on but when he gets to to progressive division of labor with bourgeois ideology, right? He says, uh, 
Yeah, the part of it that interests him is the division of labor, really, right? That's how I think how capitalism appears here. Uh, and he gives a sort of definition of its its limits. He says, if I can find it. Mm. Oh, I think the uh, the division of flavor is sorry, I'm not very good English, but oh. I think the Bogdanov proposed a different definition about class, not, not only about labor. I agree. They, they think um, the, differ, the difference between classes is who control the process of organization and not who, con who have the property of the, of the main production only. Yeah, they it's true. They, 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 they propose a different a different a different vision about the class distinction I think and this I think in, interesting because these uh, have a, another meaning about proletariat because the proletariat have the people doesn't have control of the process of work of the process of production of the organization in this case, class case. And I think this interesting about to thinking about how how the capitalism works and how the the proletariat fighting in the capitalism. And I think this is interesting because uh, for this reason the this book is so Complicated from Lenin and Stalin. Yes, <laughs> and, okay. because they, the the process of organization, I think, uh, in Union Soviet Union, uh, is still, still, split it still, separado. Yeah, split. It's still split it and then have have to do the, the jobs and how and how and who control the organization thing. I think this is interesting. Yeah, and I, I then, really agree with you. I, at first, when I read it, I thought he was, uh, how do you say it, uh, uh, too simple. Because there is, this, there is a lot of discussion in Marxism to say class is not a group of people, right? Class is a structure and so on. And then he says things like, well, there are, there are organizing views, different organizing views between classes. And it looks like it's reducing it to people, fighting people, like a class war. But I think what you said is totally right. Like, it's actually even more abstract than just being a structural position, right? It's very broad because it's, you can take over the means of production. You can actually own them, but not really have the means to develop a different way of organizing the things you own, right? So you can own them, but by a natural tendency, a spontaneous tendency, you will have to organize with the social te technology that was available. So you can have to, re I think this is something very important in his idea, in his study, that because he treats the organization of things, of ideas, of experience, as all being forms of organization. To the means of production in terms of technological means of production is just one of three means that you could take power of, right? You could take power of different ways of organizing ideas, different ways of organizing experience. And let's say you own technology, but the means of organizing people remain the same, even though some changes will happen by necessity because things are organized in new ways, you might have to resort to, let's say, the known ways of organizing people that we already have. So states, hierarchy, and things like this. So there is a sort of kind of triad that I think has is a sort of the technological aspect of politics, right? The organization of things the kind of 
proper political dimension of politics or, or the organization of people. And you have the sort of epistemological dimension of it, right? Which is also aesthetic and is epistemological, which is the organization of experience. Uh, and apparently this three, a class should have a meaning for these three things. It shouldn't have the meaning only of one, right? And it's not really the same as saying the real is economy and then these other things are the superstructure. That's not really how the metaphor is organized, right? Uh, it seems like they're, they all have the same dignity. They're all realms of organizing. It's, they're not uh, totally separate. And one is totally conditioned on the other, even though he shows that one thing follows from the other, right? Well, that's part of his point about the world war being a school of organization, right? When he says that they discovered through the war that the other two dimensions could supplement a lack in the third and that they could be kind of moved around depending on the circumstance and that one of them wasn't necessarily privileged if they could like problem solve with organizing people better and raising the spirit of the forces then they could get around a technological lack there wasn't this kind of like stacked hierarchy of oh we got to fix the technology in order to be able to resolve Absolutely. issues with people and so yes. that's part of and that's a big difference i think between how you know, Lenin and other Marxists saw uh, the relationship between the war and the revolution was that it was the revolution that you see as the school and the war was just the crisis within which the revolution happened. For Bogdanov, the war actually opened up the ability to see this triad as being a kind of like interconnected and, you know, logically uh equal i guess even if they're different fields yeah, he the even earth. says this right he says the three aspects right the the organization of human forces material means and ideology in practice they appear as equals at every step each element can be substituted for the other right so yeah i think it totally backs up what you said like it's also interesting because when he takes the war is like uh a school of organization if you if you kind of look backward on revolutions up to the russian revolution most of the revolutions had a war that preceded them whether it was the french revolution yeah. or the, the the paris commune so that there seems to be like a much tighter uh logical connection between these massive conflicts and revolutionary changes as opposed to the kind of idea you get of the war is just a kind of backdrop and condition for the rising consciousness of a revolution. There's something in the linkage between those two that is educational and that really shows the, the importance of education, which is what a lot of like military historians argue that modern warfare is what brought logistics up, yeah. made logistics into its own science, and then that passed over into capitalism as a science to be practiced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that this this makes a lot of sense, especially because from the from the 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 sort of big Marxists of early Soviet thinking, I think Bogdanov was the one that was most engaged in the war. Like he was actually a doctor in the war front, and uh, he said he says in his biography, in his autobiography, that was one of the most important experiences for him. So there is a very good chance that it, the strength with which he engages with this idea of organization is very much like a consequence of him being schooled through the war, you know, and not simply, let's say, because I totally agree with you, it's a difference of saying the war teaches something about this new approach to things, then talking about the war as a sort of good conjuncture, right? It's an opportune moment to do what we already know. It's different from saying the war showed that th there is this other perspective on things, right? In those things you've read about the his kind of history, Gabriel, is there anything, does he engage with Lenin's argument to bring in Taylorism and scientific management? Because it seems like there would be a, a 
a debate there because Lenin just kind of imports bourgeois organizational methods and they bring back a lot of the old managers and stuff and seem to kind of like, you know, at the level of actual organizational theory, just bring back what was already in place or try to update it with what America and Germany are doing. Yeah, there, um, is, there is a mention to that. And I think that, uh, I know Hansel read this book uh, by this guy called Robert Linha, who studies Lenin's texts from, uh, this, this is his name. Uh, it's called Lenin, Taylor and the Peasants. I think it's with the T. Uh, and I, I, just to connect with what you said, uh, I think that it's interesting because it's not like Bogdanov takes the sides of the peasants while Lenin takes the sides of the industrial workers, but there is something to that. I think Bogdanov is kind of like a Maoist avant la lettre in the idea that like, if you define Maoism with this kind of revolution inside the revolution, right? You take power, but then you need to revolutionize the party because the, the bureaucratic culture of communists themselves is out of date with its own, with the very forces it unleashes in China, right? There is something similar that I do think that puts him closer to the side of peasant culture than Lenin. Like, I think you, what this Linkhart guy shows very nicely is that there is a total change in perspective in Lenin in like six months. In February, like January 1917, Lenin is one of the few people who realizes that the time of the crops in Russia, which was October, is going to create a, a point of decision. Like the peasants will have to decide will they give the crops? to the landowners or will they keep the crops? So that's like a concrete moment based on material necessity where a decision concerning who owns the crops will have to be made. And like, that's when the Bolshevik party actually changes its line, right? It was against the sort of moving the focus from the cities to the fields, but they actually decide to back that decision to, to kind of support the decision of the peasants to keep the crops. But then very quickly, six months, a whole new problem emerges because people were starving in the fields. Now that they have their crops, they don't want to, again, give it away to the city because it's already not a, not a large crop. The situation was already very bad. There was a lot of hunger. So they hide from the provisory government the crops, right? And Lenin and, they, and, and the party they send to the fields, people to learn where are the crops going since they're not being distributed with, and shared with the city. And when he sees that there is a sort of resistance from the, the peasants to enter into a new regime of distribution, right? So the first movement, the decision was, do you give it to others or do you keep it to yourself? But in the second moment, the decision changes and it becomes, do you give it to the landowners or do you give it to the socialist party, right? Do you still distribute it socially? And the peasants kind of become reactive. And then Linkhart shows that there was no solution at the table available for Lenin other than say, we need a military kind of intervention that to organize distribution of resources by force from the fields to the city, right? And then in his argument is that uh, this is connected to his trust in Taylor because the idea in Taylorism, because the idea was uh, this thing that looks like a sort of violent imposition on the peasants because labor is a universal thing because the division of labor into minutes, hours, and, and it's a sort of universal form, what now looks like a separatist or conflictive move, once this is uh, uh, applied, will be the basis for a unification of the field and the city, right? The sort of necessary imposition that looks like a sacrifice, but once peasants themselves start to be more like uh, city workers, 
there will be a kind of some homogeneity produced. And for Linhart, like Lenin should be credited with, with the uh, military organization of labor in the fields, not Stalin, because even though he applied it in his lifetime to the distribution of goods, uh, I mean, it's just, if you just take that thinking to its natural conclusion, why just distribute goods in this way? Why not just produce them in that way already? Uh, so there is a kind of a, a conflict, a concrete conflict, like not a philosophical problem, right? How the hell do you solve this issue with the tension between city and, and the field and the peasants and the workers, right? This in, internal contradiction that every socialist project has to deal with. Uh, and then there is a trust in Taylor. Like Taylor is not, let's say, a philosophical stake. It's a totally organized, like political organizational problem. And he offers a solution. Like if we homogenize the means of, of looking at the field and the city by looking at both through this sort of strongly organized discipline form of production, we will also produce social homogeneity that will kind of undo the tension, right? Uh, and I think that if you look at Bogdanov's position, like he has a critique of, I know of a text where he critiques Lenin, uh, but he's, he's usually very, it's funny, he, he, he thinks Lenin is a moron in philosophy, but he clearly admires the guy as a political tactician and strategist. Like he's not a, he's not, he doesn't take easy, like doesn't take easy punches. Like, so it, I don't know of anything where he simply says, oh, the guy is a monster. Because if you were honest person living there, probably it was hard to think of anything else. But uh, it's interesting just to see what he did, right? After the Russian Revolution, he leaves. The, he's actually expelled from the party, but he doesn't try to to stay there. And he goes to create this sort of schools for proletarian culture, right? This movement, proletcult, which is not. They're not urban, like it's not in Petrograd, Leningrad, or whatever. They are schools in outer places. It it seems that he thought that you couldn't just bring more formal labor to solve this issue, right? Which seems very fitting with this. And he does seem to have a more, uh, he does, in my opinion, he thinks that peasants think. Like, you know, this whole point about primitive religious, then popular technology, you can see he's not, this is, this is the same thing as science. It's just, applied to a different size of the world, right? If you're living with a certain degree of complexity and stuff, yeah, popular sayings are ways of transferring methods or whatever, right? So I think that he has a much more, uh, he probably would be, I'm not sure if in the context he would act differently, but he surely had a bit more of a, a charitable perspective towards the supposedly more reactionary part of the Russian people, you know? So I'm not sure what would come out of that that's different, but I do think that there is something to it that is that is different. And that connects to the problem of Taylorism as a sort of, not only as a theory of Taylorism, not only as a sort of wager on how to, to, to bet on economic development, but also as a way to solve social conflict, which I think it, this book by Linhart really shows that Lenin also had that in mind, you know, perhaps even before anything else. It's it's really amazing this book. I'm it's a, I'm not sure if it's in English, but it's I really recommend it. Yeah, it's a really really great book. And that example of uh, that Bogdanov gives on the war, I think, is really illuminating. Like on the way, like. On, with limitation of technical uh, development, which are like limitations on organization of things, you, you can try to fill in the problem with uh, organizing people, like putting people, more people in the, in the front lines, but you can also use like uh, uh, organization of ideas. You can just like mobilize through like ideology. So 
he, he looks at it as not some kind of like, he looks at different like technological solutions for the same problem. And in a way, like uh, uh, in this Linhard book, it seems that uh, you can like get different problems pertaining to coming from different like um, aspects being experienced or things. For example, the, the problem you were saying about uh, the, the peasants, how you distribute uh, the, the food that they, yeah. uh, they put to the city. It, in, in, in a sense, it, it boiled down to like a, a kind of like ideological uh, problem that, that the peasant wouldn't understand that they, they, it, was, it made sense for them to, to give up the food. So in a sense, given this kind of like ideological problem, Lenin had first, before, before uh, the revolution, he defended a more like um, a different kind of organization solution for work in the, in, the, in, the, in, in the rural, in the farms. But given this problem, he kind of, he, he uses militarization to solve that. And he kind of like dislocates the kind of like emancipatory principle to from work from things to people like from the state apparatus being the the place where the revolution was happening and, mm -hmm. and not anymore like uh production and and you could like i can i, I think you you could do this kind of analysis of, of of how you once you get to limitations in one kind of organization you can then displace it into it like for example you could then say that in stalinism what was left of the revolution was not the state was only the ideology in, in terms of an organizational pr principle that was kind of like filling up for the the lack of success in the in the other mm -hmm. domains and but if you turn that around and say that uh, if it's actually relevant the way you organize uh, all these three aspects then the, the state organizing produ uh, the production is, is constituting a different point of view than organization point of view than the, I don't know, the, the, so the workers taking on production because although they, in the, functionally, they are doing the same function, like you're, you're making property collective in some way, the mediation, the way you implement that is one true centralization in the state power and the other through like self-organizing you're giving rise to really completely different like organizational point of views yeah um, for example one thing that i remember we spoke about this uh this example that i really like i think now that you said this it actually could be an example of why we need to talk about three different kind of ways of taking the means of organizing something because Remember that example that Norbert Wiener, he went, he was invited to go to Detroit to, to automate the first automobile factory. And he went there and he saw what would happen, like most workers would lose their jobs. And he refused to do it. And he wrote a letter to the head of the trade union in Detroit of automobile. So like the largest uh, automobile trade union the largest workers union, I think, in America at the time, it was like the 50s, right? And he said, look, I was just invited to automate your factory. I declined, but someone else will do it. You guys need to run and find a way to exert power in that domain. Like, I don't know, buy patents, intellectual property, something. And the, the letter from the trade union back to him is like the most tragic thing because it's like, you don't know where the struggle is. You don't know what is important. You think that it's technology and science, but that's like idealistic stuff. Uh, work is what makes the world go round and things like this and leave it to us. We know what we're doing. You know, we're like the most powerful trade union ever. So fuck off, Who, what do you know? And then Detroit collapses, right? In the next 30 years and becomes this sort of uh, emblem of, the decadence of industrial America, right? And it, like, what is missing? Like, what is the miscommunication between two people in that situation? It does seem like it's a sort of 
clearly Norbert Wiener had very little contact with the actual workers' movement. He saw the letter. People would just say, thank you so much, Norbert Wiener, for your letter. Your, your letter. Now we're going to change everything. But probably if he was a bit more intimate with the workers' movement, he would know that there is a sensibility that goes together. Like there's an organization of experience that goes together with the organization of means of production. And I think that if only there was a different way of experiencing what it means to be working, right? Because most of the industrial experience of work has to do, uh, and Marx says this very nicely in a very ambiguous passage on the chapter on, on manufacture and then the chapter on machines in capital, that machines kind of, in, because machines are preceded, right? Before you implement machines in factories, you actually make people work in a more machine-like way. So social relations between people in a way that they are treated as cogs or treated as parts of a collective system appeared before machinery. Like in manufacture, uh, you already had that. And it's because people were organized in that way that then machines could substitute them. Because first you need to turn actions into, let's say, things that are describable by a command, right? So before you can have a machine that ties together a bunch of actions and gets some output, you need to be able to distinguish the work process in a way that it's made of those actions, right? So before you need workers to be a bit like machines, and no wonder that Babbage, the guy who developed like the first, some of the first intuitions on computer, he actually wrote the first books on very modern organization of work. But then Marx says, when you organize in this way and machines embody social relations in this way, the tendency is for workers to see machines as the very embodiment of alienation, right? So I'm now an appendage and machines are at the center, but in the, there is a struggle, who is more important, right? me and my knowledge or the machine. So there is a tendency for this struggle to happen between you and the machinery. The idea that you should be able to look at the machinery as being your, let's say, both taking your place and at the same time being yours, is a very weird way of organizing how you describe work. So I wonder if this isn't a good way of talking about the sort of shortcomings of not having this sort of organization of experience as a concern as well, because you can't really convince people to buy intellectual property or to get into uh, the design of a factory, you know, and, and make that the trade unions problem without making that the business of workers, right? One thing is to say, I own the factory because I don't want to be submitted to it anymore. Another thing that is very different is saying, I own, like, it's also my problem how I submit to the factory. Like, I need to actually sit down with people and think how it should be automated, for example. Seems like a slightly different issue. Then it's not a property issue, right? It's a, I don't know, science issue or something. So, I don't know, I find that, that kind of miscommunication between. Norbert Wiener and the trade union guy. I really wish I could find the letters. I think they're easy to find online. Gabriel, uh, just one thing. Uh, this passage that, that you were, were talking about from manufacture to the great industry, don't you think that when Bogdanov talks about the idea as a tool, as, a, as the second tool, he talks about uh, uh, three kinds of uh, ideas and the passage from the the technical idea to the uh, idea of science is something like this this passage that, that you just mentioned from manu manufacture to, to to industry i don't know if yeah it makes it makes sense to me but but i don't think it's like in marx doesn't seem to it's no, very no. ambiguous the way that this this chapters in in capital are very strange i think from cooperation, like the whole description of actual organization in capital 
So the chapters that describe how people actually do things in production, they're all within the section on relative surplus value, right? So cooperation, manufacture, industry, uh, work, uh, uh, housework, and um, modern manufacture, like the whole description of how people combine their labor, everything is done under relative surplus. So it's weird because on the one hand, Marx is talking about the power of organizing, Look at how people doing things differently can do much more. So there is a kind of a slightly poetic tone and kind of sometimes he seems very uh, admi like admiring it. And then he says, but you know what the outcome is? People get hungrier, weaker, and like things go to hell. But it's very weird, right? How it's th those chapters. And I think that, uh, that with this idea that Bogdanov presents, it becomes clearer for me. Like this, I only understood this part about manufacturing and industry after I read a bit of Bogdanov because it's, it should be striking. When we read usual uh, descriptions of technology, history of technology, history of, even in Marxism, it should, the intuition is that it should be the opposite, right? First, we introduce machines which are material and objective, and then people become more like machines. That's like uh, our kind of cultural studies today describe things. Like the more you're attached to machines, the more you become like machines. But in, in capital, the connection is inverse. Like first uh, you start with cooperation and then you see that cooperation is way too powerful because cooperation doesn't really connect people. It can connect actions between people without connecting the people. Therefore, you can connect people in weird ways. You can kind of split people into, into parts and connect the parts of people and not really connect human beings. So it's a very strange domain. And then it says that it's because cooperation is so plastic that it can allow uh, capital, capital to organize laborers as if they're just partial uh, parts of a process. And the whole process is only seen by the collective. And only after this, only after you change the part and whole relation, then machines appear, right? So, uh, and in fact, in historical sense, it actually makes sense because Babbage was first writing on political economy and then writing on computers and the sort of basic structure of uh, concatenating actions in the way of descri fully describing some process, right? Uh, so it's strange because isn't that idealist? Like, isn't that the, the bad history? the history of subjectivity first and then objectivity. Of first people relate and there is some abstract thing and then you have machines, right? But I think that, uh, and to go to a topic that we debated already, Hakel, it's very much exactly like the value form because first you have some social relation, for example, the relation of value and then you find something material that embodies the social relation, right? So it's not that gold is value, right? Is the form of value. But because the form of value has some structure, gold was a good material to embody, right? Uh, or salt or silver or whatever. So strangely enough, it's the social relation that is concrete and the material, which is the abstract embodiment of something concrete, right? Uh, and something similar happens with machines. The concrete part is that people connect in the production as if they're parts of a whole, and the whole is a sum of their parts. And then machines embody that relation. It's not the inverse. And I find it very counterintuitive at first, but it, it only, I only felt okay with that idea once I was convinced by the idea that 
well, why is the organization of people less material than the organization of parts in a machine, right? Uh, but there is some, some strange intuition there. You also have this kind of transitionary point between manufacturing and machines where Marx talks about that the early machines were directly modeled on what the manufacturers were doing with their hands and their tools. Yeah. But then as, as engineering technologists kind of got momentum and started experimenting, the machines became more and more inhuman because they're becoming more efficient to do their whatever function. And you see something similar in the first couple decades of, of personal computers and microprocessors where at first computers were just used to replace what people were doing by hand or with typewriters and, and calculators. They were just used for word processing, accounting, calculations. But as they developed, you get into the place where you realize that you can actually open up new ways of organizing data, organizing algorithms, and they begin to take a life of their own. But you have to have this step where first they kind of mirror what humans were doing with tools before mm -hmm. they can kind of fully get their own autonomy. And then you kind of actually see what the machines can do. And I think part of what Mark shows in that passage is that people don't really understand the potentials of machines. They have to first go through this mimetic phase where they're mirroring people. And then you see, oh, wow, like we could actually take this to the nth degree and really kind of unleash mm -hmm. new potentials. Yeah, I totally agree with you. But I think that I would, I think it's the two, two part argument, right? In the same way that there is no teleology. The moment that gold becomes the embodiment of value, well, gold has its properties and new things are possible that weren't possible just with, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a money commodity that was shifting. Once it's established as gold, a lot of things happen, uh, which are not prescribed by necessity. It just, they happen because that material embodiment happened. And I think the same thing goes for machines, right? It's true in some sense that they're mirror, like they're embodying a structure that was there before. You wouldn't, and I mean, this is important actually because Marx, Marx argument about automation and machinery depends on this. He says, nobody's gonna use automation or machinery as long as employing people is cheaper. So there is no teleology of automation. It's necessary for capitalism. Where it's cheaper to employ miserable people, it will always prefer to employ miserable people because it's cheaper. So you get the clear sense that machines are embodying something that was already there before in a sort of relational way. But the ones that they embody that, they, I mean, you can, God knows what you can do, right? It's not just there for, to be the embodiment. So it's still free to become some other thing. Uh, but this, I think that this actually, this argument that we're discussing, it connects very nicely to the beginning of the text, something that I thought, found was a bit, I'm not sure if I'm reading too much into it. I'm not sure what you guys think, but like this beginning, right? He says this thing with, uh, the I mean, very old fashioned, the, the description that this, the struggle of mankind in, in its aim is the dominion over nature and that dominion is relationship of organizer to organized, uh, that uh, this is the meaning and content of the age long labor of mankind. Uh, I do like in this first passage that, and I think Mackenzie work shows this very nicely that uh, the way that that uh, Bogdanov suggests that class struggle will end is that he says this somewhere else that in a very nicer way, it's like class struggle is a sort of repression of the struggle between man and nature. So rather than struggling with nature as, a, as mankind, you divide mankind into a part of mankind that doesn't struggle with nature and a part that does. The part that does is called the working class. And it fuels the resistance of nature and the, which is what we call the forces of production. And then it connects with the, the other classes in terms of the relations of production. And rather than having a sort of harmonic view 
of what happens when you end class struggle, you actually democratize the struggle with nature everywhere, right? So the end of class struggle wouldn't be the overcoming of struggle, would be just a sort of moving the discontent in civilization to the discontent in nature, right? Something doesn't fit. We need a lot. There are no solutions. We don't know what to do. There is a meteor. There is scarcity. There is ecological problems. Like those things still be around. So, for example, when you read Bogdanov's Utopia, right, his first science sci-fi book, uh, uh, The Red Planet, and and then the other one called The uh, Engineer Mary. I don't remember the, many. The Engineer Many. They're not books about like everything is good in an utopia. They're like the kind of adventure books about things going wrong. You know, like you need to build a bridge or a tunnel and the terrain doesn't allow you to, oh my God, we have not enough wealth to do this thing, but we need to do it. But then what shifts is who struggles with nature? It just becomes a global problem, right? So it's an adventure for everyone. It's not just a problem for a few without proper resources. So uh, even though this, this passage looks a bit kind of like classic Marxism of humanity is the animal that dominates nature, nature is our bitch, and let's just uh, uh, rule over everything. If you look at like the Bogdanov's general work, you can see that when he talks about the age-long labor of mankind, it's very much in a sort of enthusiastic way. Like people were made to be, to struggle with the things they're made of. That's let's say the good life, to be perpetually afraid of nature rather than to be perpetually afraid of each other. <laughs> That's kind of like uh, how he begins. It's not very clear here, but I think it's, it's very uh, clear in other of his books. But the thing I wanted to pay attention to is that so he talks about nature resisting, right? And uh, uh, we need to organize to counter uh, this sort of resistance of nature. Uh, the unit of this sort of survival problem is the working collective. But then he says this thing where he distinguishes tools, right? He says, if we only organize nature with the forces and means given to us by it, we wouldn't have any adventure over the other living creatures, which also fight for survival. In its labor, mankind uses tools, which it takes from the external nature. So that's the first definition, like a connection between uh, mankind organization of nature through tools. But then he says something else, which I think this is the this is the main paragraph, right? He says, the more difficult than organizing external nature, right? An even more difficult problem uh, for mankind is to individually and collectively organize itself. Uh, in the complexity of human organism and society, blind and conflicting elemental forces are hidden, at times as terrible and destructive as the forces of nature. Uh, so the most destructive and monstrous explosion of these forces are actually human nature and not external nature, right? This whole pa paragraph is talking about something that is internal to humanity, not external, right? Uh, so it's self-organization of mankind is a struggle with its own internal biological and social primordial forces. For this, mankind needs tools just as much as for the struggle with external nature, although different tools, namely instruments of organization. So it's interesting that you actually have a division between uh, tools for external transformation, right? And tools for internal transformation. And tools like a hammer, they, they are adequate for external transformation, but he puts on the same level or even with more difficult, so even a higher level of problem, developing what he calls instruments for organization. And I think that what we were talking about machinery and, uh, and manufacture, you have that sort of thing. You, you would put manufacture here. The, the manufacture form is a way of organizing 
the biological and social forces of humankind, right? Dividing people in the production process and so on. And then this becomes a way of turning, of transforming uh, external nature. So there is this, and this sort of idea that an internal transformation precedes an external transformation. It's all through this book. Uh, and I think that it, uh, the reason why I'm mentioning this is that it goes very well with what we were talking about last time when I mentioned that the project I'm involved with Paraná concerns applying stuff to the organization of the left before you apply it to the outside. So I think it has a similar intuition, you know, and uh, so, but I think that this principle that this comes in somehow epistemologically, this comes first, and then you get this, right? First, you invent new ideas on how to organize life, which is still is material and still concerns survival. But once you do this, you tend to reinvent the way that you organize external nature. So I think that this is this this seems justified in, in Bogdanov's view, because once he moves, I mean, he then gives this sort of three instruments of organization or three vehicles, right? The word, uh, ideas, and social norms. Uh, and he, he says that these are ways of organizing experience. Uh, but once he defines all of this and he goes into the way we organize things, uh, I think that there are actually two movements, right? Because I, I wouldn't know how to form, how to schematize this, but there seems to be in this part too, right? The idea that nature, uh, it, it does things to itself in terms of, he talks about insects, patriarchy in insect colonies and uh, things like this. And because we are also part of nature, so man also organizes in similar ways, right? Uh, so that seems to be a first movement where nature comes first, let's say natural external reality comes first, and we our way of doing things comes second. But then in the third part of the book of the chapter when he's talking about religion and uh, popular uh, sectology and so on, it seems like it's the inverse. The way that man relates to, it, to themselves uh, precedes the way that we then relate to nature. So it's a, a bit of a weird kind of uh, connection, right? Uh, yeah, Gabriel, I, I had a question. I think uh, you answered part of it, but um, like in the beginning part, um, I didn't get to read the entire essay, but the beginning part, uh, I cannot shed the feeling that uh, the language he's using is uh, a little bit teleological. Um, I mean, the, he opens up by saying that there is, a, there is an aim to the struggle between, uh, between human and nature. Uh, and that um, basically, uh, especially with the, with the comparison uh, he makes between uh, the tendency to organize among, uh, among humans and the, uh, and, and the natural uh, tendency for organization, uh, which he calls elemental organization, um, basically uh, points to a common theme between nature and man, and that is uh, the uh, tendency to survival. Mm -hmm. So organization is uh, both uh, a vehicle uh, it seems both in nature and uh, man as part of the nature uh, in order to survive. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that a, a general characterization of what he sees organization in this section? Yeah, I, I kind of think there is like this idea. I mean, the only, he talks about this aim, which is dominion, but then he also says that he doesn't make this the thing that define uh, humanity, right? He says, in the struggle of mankind with aim, elements, its aim is the dominion over nature. Like, it, 
It's different than saying that mankind's place is to dominate nature, I think. Because then he says that other living creatures also fight for survival against the rest of nature, right? Mm -hmm. So it does seem to put us in the same category so far as everyone is just trying to yeah. stay alive. And especially like dominion over nature is not an uh, ethical comport. It is like a survival is a very materialistic thing. It's not yeah, like so we are we are created in order to have uh, uh, to basically answer our uh, essential uh, kind of like the Heideggerian call for uh, truth or something. It's just like the rest of the uh, do domain of nature. We are creatures of nature and. Uh, we survive. We struggle for survival, yeah. and uh, and nature basically creates pathways in order for this struggle to uh, to go through through uh, evolution, uh, and and humans basically learn these pathways and then uh, imitate this organization, uh, but in ways that is particular to humans, like for example, through words, ideas, and social norms. Yeah, I agree with you. He has this idea that it's tools that provide mankind with a growing superiority over the strongest and terrible giants of elemental life, distinguishing us from the rest of the nature's kingdom. Uh, so there is this sort of, that's where we, I mean, if you guys remember less one of the last meetings we had, we made this distinction, right, between, just had this here, uh, between, there was this little drawing I made of, we, Dennis and I were using it, right, where you have, we can put it nature here, why not? Nature and, uh, and, and from nature, all the parts of the production process come, right, so, the material. Uh, I don't see anything, or I don't see anything on the. Uh, sorry, this me neither. Yeah, I'm just trying to see if it. It works. Okay. Yeah. So the material, then nature also provides the tools. If they're made of material stuff, uh, it provides the land, and then we said, yeah, that there is something weird, which is nature makes man. Uh, and in some sense, it makes the, the, the limits of man's efforts. So our efforts are sometimes somehow limited by nature, but the design, uh, that let me just change the color here. The design that goes into organizing efforts, tools, land, and material, right? Into some, some final product. This design is actually not fully determined by nature. And there is this distinction we use between saying that the land, the material, the tools, and the effort are subjected to natural laws, right? But the design is actually based not on what needs to be, but on rules. So we made the distinction between natural laws and rules. And he kind of does that when he talks about words uh, ideas and social norms as a sort of unique instruments of organization, right? And then we, we said, okay, so, so a big task for Marxism is to explain the meaning of this arrow. Why is man's determination of nature distinct from a natural law so that we are, this design is not fully determined by the things it is connecting, right? And I think that we sh this is something nice to have in mind so we can ask of the book when as we're reading it, because uh, as we were ta uh, saying last time, right? Uh, just gonna make this a bit clearer. So if you have, let's say, nature. These things are kind of under natural laws. 
and somehow you have this sort of man is here and there is something we Marx calls the design that defines how you turn this into something else. So the product, the end product has one property, which is that it would never have appeared spontaneously, right? Natural law, natural law seem to be somehow connected with the idea of spontaneous change or a tendency. But somehow you, we can organize things so that they happen against a regular tendency. Well, the, the name people usually give, for example, in physics, for taking a system out of its natural tendency against its natural tendency is work. And then we have this to explain, okay, how can it be that we can put things to work against their natural tendency, right? And we know some answers. The first answer is that we are absolutely different. So work, capacity for labor, not even work in the physics sense, but capacity for labor makes us different from everything in nature by essence. The second answer is uh, total indifference, the idea that there is nothing special, right? Absolutely no distinction, so indistinct. which is to say, you can either say, well, but there's actually a natural law to how people do things. Social norms, ideas, and words, they're actually ultimately defined by natural laws. Society is organized because it's naturally for it to be organized in this way, or you can have the more leftist ecologic idea that uh, it's not that man is like everything else, but everything else is just like man, right? So all animals also labor, uh, nothing is spontaneous, everything in some sense is kind of like you can treat every species as being bound by rules and not by biological tendencies or something. And then there is this third thing we were trying to explore that I think is kind of like where, where Bogdanov comes in. Because the distinction will be real, right? But it's not a matter of essence as it's the case here. But it's something else, right? It's because these are all like there is some sort of of, of uh, similarity because for him these are all forms of organization. These are also forms of organization. So there is some common terrain before there is some dif difference, right? So it's so here if here is the common version, and here is the difference version. Here with Badu, we have something like common, where, where we are like nature, but we are also different. And the issue is how to bind these two things together, right? And I well, think that's that, where, yeah. Well, isn't that part of where, um, like, especially going back to the earlier point you're making about, you know, things seem to kind of start coming from nature, but then there's this shift where they come from humanity. That's in part the, the development of specialization, right? Because he begins by comparing specialization in humans with specialization in ant colonies and termites and whatnot. But as it develops, it actually shifts the way that humans see nature and it moves away from that earlier kind of classic natural philosophy and monism to where it stops being a kind of natural spontaneous way of dividing human beings up and, and takes on something that is separate to a certain degree. Yeah, I think that this, I agree with you that this is a, this connects to, to this issue, uh, the sort of, I, I would call that, uh, the theme, and I'm really interested in this. I, I would put it in this in this terms. It's called surrogate. Just write it. Uh, surrogate reasoning. Surrogate reasoning is a field today that studies the way that we can displace. In Portuguese, is raciocínio delegado, 
uh, like de delegado para alguém, né? Uh, the idea is that you, for example, you have some some problem in your mind. Uh, you can instantiate it in in some material thing, and then the material thing works with itself in a way that you couldn't solve it in your head, right? So they're studying, for example, uh, why certain supports solve help you solve problems that you cannot solve without the support. And it's not simply, for example, because it stores memory better than you. For example, I want to remember how to go to my grandmother's house. If I actually draw a map, right, with the streets and I do this and then I get there, okay, I can have information about all of these houses and their relations all kept together in the map. I can have more information in the, in the map than I could have in my head, right? But they try to go further with this and their point is that uh, there is something called a freeloader determination, which is the idea that once you instantiate a problem on a material support, the material support might have means to do more than the problem you wanted to solve, right? So when I, when I drew my map, I only wanted to go to my grandmother's house. All I needed to know is that there is this street here and she lives here. But the same map that makes it easy for me to say this also contains information about, you know, the other side of the street, about the distance between me and her. So, so material supports for solving problems also pose new problems that you didn't think of, right? I think that that's one of the one of the ways of tackling what you said, John, about, you know, you might even instantiate some structure on a machine and you solve the problem of organizing some tasks. But the machine doesn't only contain information about that problem. Once you set up a machine, you can see other things you couldn't see in the initial problem, right? So there's a sort of means and ends transformation. So I think that this is this connects to that already. I, I hopefully in the future I'll try to do something on presentation on surrogate reasoning because I think we can do the same thing for organizations. Like that idea we were talking about how complex organizations might grasp better social complexity. I think it's a case of this. I might not be able to think how complex a social space is, but I might be part of an organization that can actually work through that problem, reason with social complexity better than I can. It's a bit of extended mind, David Chalmers thing, but hopefully less mega death. Like I always look at him, I think he sings in a in a 80s rock band. Uh, but I think that there is also something that in this chapter already appears, which is, uh, you know, I think that especially in this second part where he's talking about uh, the, the activity of nature, right? Uh, he's saying that after he talked, spoke about instruments of, of organization and how po politics can be put inside the field of struggle of organizational forms, right? Uh, he starts talking about nature and there is this sort of, the same idea of common but different, right? Uh, it's constantly at play. Like he talks about, uh, actually he will, he will go back to it many times, but this sort of mimesis, right? Uh, here he says it better. So the possibility of imitation, right? Is sufficient proof between the element Prove that between the elemental organization work of nature and the consciously planned work of man, there is in principle no impassable difference. Like this is a this is a statement uh, that if we go back to that little drawing, right, you can see that it is a statement about how to answer to this to this question here. Right, there is a sort of gradient between. Uh, how different we are from nature, from the rest of nature, right? So mimesis 
the fact imitating nature uh, or imitating the rest of nature. Then he says in the next paragraph about parallelism, right? So there, there, it's actually a kind of mimesis. He suggests that we both purposefully imitate, right? And that we reproduce. So uh, animals have fur. We create clothing that furs us. So there is some sort of imitation. But then he says there's also a sort of parallelism because things that could never be seen to be as the same. So people could never have looked at ants or insects and copy insects because we didn't have means to understand, but we actually do similar things, right? So uh, there's already, I mean, there seems to be rather than a sort of philosophical indistinction we are just in nature, guys. Forget about difference between humans and nature. Humans are in nature, culture is nature, and so on. Or this sort of absolute difference. Humans are absolutely out of nature. Any, any attempts to think about humans as part of nature implies some fantasy or letting go of something important. With him, you get something like a gradation, right? There are many ways in which we are similar or different. You can become more different. You can become more similar. There is some some leeway, some space, right? Uh, and yeah, on, on a naive level, you know, natural selection or whatever the evolution is a form of specialization. And yeah. the problem the problem is it cannot be surmounted with nature alone. Nature creates specialized life forms but those life forms can't uh, like jump out of their environment and uh cross forms i mean unless the environment changes drastically right so there's something about design or this surrogate reasoning or language in general is it's somehow able to accumulate things from different fields of specialization mm -hmm. to the point where they they get mixed up together and that that mixing, I think, is, is also something that nature lacks. Yeah, I think that that's a really good point. And I also think that, actually, you said this now, I think that this is a, a really important thing about Bogdanov from what I understood this far is that, for example, another way of talking, there are two ways also of talking about language according to those two other positions of absolute difference and absolute commonality, which I think is, there are many languages in nature. Languages, let's say, dolphins, dolphins have language, bees have language. Language is this sort of symbolic dimension that who said that other animals are not speaking? Like you cannot know. And there is the other version, which is language separates humans from the rest of the natural world. And I find that Bogdanov also has a very interesting position because in that part three where he's talking about the path to the organizational science and then religious thinking, then early modern or whatever you want to call it, sort of uh, generalization of sciences. There's, there is this idea that language is both a good thing and also a troubling thing. Like language helps you to transfer things through metaphors, but language cannot prevent you from using this wrong, right? So. The idea that there is one language for everything makes you think, but makes you act in a very anthropomorphized way. Like language, science could never develop if we were stuck to generalizing things through language. Because the problem is that you need to generalize and then restrict back, right? So you first learn, like you first realize in this internal way that there is an instrument of organization which is some people coordinate action and some people execute the action right some people organize some people are organized and you can do more things by doing it that way if everyone had to individually coordinate their actions to build a pyramid it wouldn't be built to build a building it wouldn't be built right things like this so you need like somebody to act like a synthesis and the other to act like 
But if you generalize this for everything, so this is, this is a new way of organizing material to think of it in those terms. And you might be able to develop a theory of cause in this way. You can talk about law, right? Natural law is a metaphor where it seems like things are obeying a command, right? If you look at when people started describing, I mean, Spinoza criticizes this, right? The sort of anthropomorphic idea of God, because if nature has laws, somebody must have created the laws. Like there is a, there is a weird, like every time you generalize a method of organization, you carry something from the field you generalize it from that doesn't apply to other fields, right? So true, I can distinguish between cause and effect, between, I can distinguish better using this social relation, but now it says too much. It says that there is a commander and things that are commanded, and that doesn't apply. So if you just trust language to generalize, it actually hinders development of, the, of cognition. It doesn't necessarily increase the size of the world. So there is a there is a constant move between these two things, right? Generalization and then specialization. And it seems like uh, you can have problems on both sides. So it doesn't seem like you could simply put the 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 responsibility for human difference on the side of language because if that was the case you might get we might have gotten stuck in other moments right uh, or you wouldn't necessarily there there are moments where this would hinder development so uh, i think that it is interesting that he puts words and he then talks about like special words for action and things like this at a lower degree of capacity for social organization, right? It does allow you to transfer things. So you develop one word that applies to many situations. That's, let's say, the basic idea of transferring between situations, right? Uh, but this can go too far. So complexes of ideas already singularize things more. Because if you have many ideas connected together, they will apply only where all the things connect, not only when you recognize the same thing, right? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I wonder if here, when we talk about language, we, we include mathematics because, or even like the language developed by science um, in, in the, Pursue, pers pursuing a particular, you know, understanding of things, right? You, you can invent more precise language that isn't anthropomorphic, but it, it takes something that's not, uh, this takes a different kind of impulse, I guess, to, to invent that language. Yeah, because that I think it comes into the process of moving from analyzing or, or the, the study of, of, you know, cutting up plots of land and agriculture towards geometry and astronomy and whatnot, like mm -hmm. the specialization yeah. that he talks about there with geometry and astronomy doesn't run into the same problems that he talks about with words passing in between. He, I think that uh, he actually says that he, because in the next chapter, he's going to distinguish between three types of organization organizations where the sum of parts is equal to the whole, organizations where the sum of parts is larger, no, the, the whole is larger than the sum of parts, and organizations where the whole is smaller than the sum of parts. And he says that mathematics is a technology for uh, systems where the whole is equal to the sum of parts. Uh, this makes sense because the mathematics in his time was pretty much at that level that, I mean, especially the stuff we've been discussing today, deals very nicely with stuff where there is generative effects. You don't need to be non-mathematical to talk about holes that are larger than the sum of the parts. But uh, he, he doesn't put mathematics together with natural language. And I think that this is actually a very nice way to understand. I was trying to find the, the quote here. Uh, 
here, for example, he's talking about the correlation between in kinship between mathematics and technology. The laws of mathematics do not refer to this or that field of the phenomena of nature, uh, but to all and any phenomena, and only from the point of view of their magnitude. So he's still also very much talking about uh, mathematics as the science of magnitudes, which is how Hegel described mathematics. And I mean, it's something that actually already in Bogdanov's time wasn't really true. Uh, uh, but he, he, he goes very much so here he will define mathematics as a technology of neutral complexes so uh, pretty much of structures where the whole of the system is given by the part the propositional parts that compose it right you learn everything about a system from its propositions you could say uh but reading about that time that was changing. But I think that if we were to, to this is why it's an organizational point of view and not the point of view of symbols or language or the symbolic point of view. Because I think that even language needs to submit to organization to be useful for him, right? So language by language's sake, it will just transfer words and metaphor, metaphoric uses everywhere some will be good, some will be bad, right? But it can, has no control. But it's because language is submitted to the organization of the world that you actually get specialized languages, right? So formal language, mathematics is not a richer language than natural language. Mathematics is a weaker language than natural language. The whole point of mathematics is to say less, right? Uh, you want to be able to just say what is relevant from a certain structural point of view. You don't want to say too much about the world, right? So I, I think that's a good example of that inverse force. It's not always about saying something general about everything because you might have generalized too much. You might have taken something that's local and treated it as, as global, right? So the same time that you need the force to remove you from the world, almost like a delirium, you also need something that makes that delirium function back in the world, right? So that you can actually look into the black box of actual things. So I think that it's a, it's a different uh, view than you, you can't really explain this, neither with labor, because for him, animals labor, like in this sense of work, of going against the spontaneous tendency, everything that survives goes against some spontaneous tendency. You cannot put the world on the side of spontaneity and humans on the side of labor. So he doesn't do that total distinction, but he also doesn't accept that language does that total distinction because we would just be delirious creature if words could be applied to anything. And that's the limit of it, right? So isn't organization a sort of combination of work and language? Like if you make language work and you, if you also talk about the language of work, right? You're pretty much in, in between of the two. You get some idea of a structure, structuring of actions, right? Something like that, which I think is the, the thread he tries to pull. So not all on the side of uh, nature, being included in nature, but also not totally separated. Also not totally separated because of labor, because other animals labor, and not totally separated because of language, because if that was the case, we would be uh, stuck, or, or the tendency would always be to generalization without capturing reality. Right, necessarily. So this is uh, this is where I uh, was mentioning uh, the the concept of telos in uh, in that. So I mean, uh, for it seems that for him, um, uh, existence um, is um, having an organization. Because yes, he, he says this even explicitly, right? Yeah. That that this organization, it, complete disorganization, is a concept without meaning. <clears throat> without meaning, um, and from a pragmatic perspective, he says that uh, since 
uh, every uh, everywhere uh, the existence uh, come to uh, be realized uh, if um, an organization is uh, experiencing a resistance from another organization. Uh, so uh, an, another organization comes to um, uh, comes to encounter the other organization, the existence of another organization, uh, because of uh, because of or existence of another thing, another being because of the uh, resistance that it exerts against the uh, original organization. So for him, um, for him organization, uh, every form of being, every form of existence, I should say, um, <clears throat> he, although that he doesn't make the distinction between being and existence, uh, every form of existence is uh, some form of uh, organization. Uh, so, and every form of organization is formed for the purpose of the survival uh, within the domain of nature. So, you can say that uh, probably in Bogdanov's view, <clears throat> uh, the elements or the, he calls, he calls the instruments of organization, uh, one of them is word and language, uh, is and basically purposeful or useful uh, in so far as it contributes to uh, the main telos of the of the uh, organization, which is survival. So in this case, if for example, language exceeds its own capability uh, in terms of uh, basically establishing uh, an organization or through this exceeding, it establishes forms of organization that does not contribute to survival, then it will be extinct. Yeah, I think that there is a distinction there, though, between, I mean, I don't think he's, he's a teleological thinker, but I think he's very- it Doesn't inspired. make sense to me either, uh, but it seems to- Yeah, I think it's more about Darwin than teleology, like, Things survive if they relate to the, uh, the ex real existing world. They don't survive because. Yeah. So I think it's about the past and not about the future. No, uh, by by saying a telos, I'm saying organization itself is not the telos. Organization is just the means. a way for yeah. It's a means for uh, for survival, and survival is what. Uh, what nature does, or what organisms in nature do, or yeah, what I don't, physical I don't think law. That he, yeah, I, I don't think that he will put survival. I mean, I see your point. Like the construction would be something like survival is the aim, and organization is the means. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, but I think that in the way that the book. But he doesn't say that that way. I, I agree, and I don't like it that way. But this is for some way to conceptualize it. Yeah, I agree that it's close to that. But uh, but it's weird because organism. I mean, I think again. I think that the best way to to deal with this is to really take seriously the idea of point of view. Right? It's not so much. It's not a philosophy of organization in the sense of uh, the true is that people are organized and that all. It's all about that. Is it's, I think it's his idea is to substitute philosophy with this. So it doesn't matter why people organize. It's just that when you see from the perspective of organization, you see more. I think that's the basic statement. Like when you see in terms of ideas, of virtue, of volition, of desire or whatever, you see less things or you see less connections. When you see things from the perspective of organization, you see more connections, you see more things. So, uh, for example, I think that as I would guess that as every Soviet Marxist from that time, he would have a clear answer to this problem of the Talos, which is 
mankind's telos is to invent mankind's telos. Like, people are meant to do whatever it is that historically people designed that they should be doing. Like, it's, it's it never comes to assessing the ends, I think. So, uh, I wouldn't go as far as saying that he's committed to the idea that mankind's ultimate goal is to strive with nature. Because if you read both this book and his other stuff, I mean, he's a sci-fi sci author and things like this. And the books are not about struggling to survive in the sense of, I would even say, I mean, this is something that I'm really interested, especially because we finished reading Badiou's book and the last chapter was called, What is to Live, right? I think if you look carefully, uh, Marxism is pretty much responsible in my opinion. I mean, okay, you could say that religions already did this, but in a secular way, Marxism is probably the first secular thinking of how surviving is not the same as living. Like Marxism is really not about surviving, right? Uh, because, I mean, Marx's early writings were already pretty much about that. Like, you know, you spend your waking life working so that you can fulfill your animal uh, necessities out of work. So all your creativity is put to the, in the service of survival and you only feel alive when you're doing things that are not singular about you, right? That's like one of his first arguments in the uh, economical philosophical manuscripts. And I think that this became a very clear kind of motto, even in, in Soviet art and, and early sort of very passionate idea that we should be doing very crazy things with our time rather than just toiling, right? I think that he fits that very nicely. And I think that one of the consequences of this idea, which is very different from Christianity, is that living is, doesn't need to be the contrary or survi of surviving, right? You can, you can imagine a society where the collective trouble of guaranteeing means of reproduction is totally connected with the most inventive spiritual tasks. You don't need to choose between the two, right? The need to choose between the two is the definite tra trait of bourgeois culture. It's, it's under the division of head and hand of manual and intellectual labor that it seems like either you choose surviving and striving with nature or engaging in spiritual activities, right? And it's very much part of the Marxist sort of underlying project, at least in some versions of it. This, the very abolishing of that distinction, or at least the mixing of the two things together. So I would, in doubt, I would put Bogdanov in part of, as part of the same thing. Like, it's good you mentioned that because that was exactly the point that I was puzzled about. Because at the beginning, it seems uh, for him, or uh, for him, the domain of subject and object doesn't seem to exist. There is no room for subject, it seems, at the, at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, hence, there is no room for truth. So that I was puzzled about that a little bit. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. So I have to read the rest of it uh, to see how within that framework, because he keeps talking about generalization, generalization. So there is no, there is like the quote that you read, there is the, the, the difference between the ways in which uh, humans organize and nature organize is not... Uh, is not a division, impassable division. And there is a way to, uh, there, is, there is a way to uh, generalize. Like following Baduian kind of framework, there is no truth in nature uh, per se. Truth is only within the realms of activities in which there is a subject. Um, so for me, it sounded like uh, he has a very uh, kind of, naturalistic look into human organization and societies and stuff like that, which yeah. uh, did not seem to jive with uh, the, the kind of framework uh, that uh, we have been dealing with. But I think that this is where, I mean, just consider two things that I think go not, not very much together in this book. It really helps when reading it. The first is that this is the guy who was engaged with the most subjectivist of Soviet projects. Like, 
proletarian culture, like sub, you know, subjective education. Like, how could he not be if he was the sort of Spencer uh, social evolutionist sort of guy? Why would he focus on education for a new world perspective? You know, like. I think this book should be understood, to put it in Badiou's terms, as a post-evental thing. I mean, the, idea, the organizational point of view is not natural, right? That people do things organizationally is absolutely impossible to avoid, but there is something that you need to engage with. It's a point of view. It's not a necess necessary point of view, right? So I think it should be read the way that it was written, right? In the middle of a revolution, it's not a book of social science, mm -hmm. though the language of politics in Soviet Russia was the language of science many times, right? So I, I think that it's important to distinguish the language of uh, this is an impartial perspective on the world that takes into consideration nature, social sociality, and so on. And the fact that this is, let's say, being pushed forward by the Bolshevik leader during a crazy period of revolution and to the point that the guy died doing it right uh so i agree the terminology doesn't fit so much but so the first thing i think to consider is this that there is a specific political project that followed from it right and it's a, it's a political project that i think has the first basic premise that you derive from reading this is that there is a political position that doesn't see material substrate so much as forms of organization, right? So as he says right at the beginning, when he says uh, that there is there is a political perspective which concerns the struggle of organizational forms, which I already lost where it is, right? This this quote here. Uh, I think that this. This connects, let's say, to the political perspective. It is a, a wager on politics. Like, look at things from the organizational point of view. It that's that gives you the truth, rather than look at it some other way, right? But second, I think that there is a consequence to to if we go to that drawing again. Uh, in this drawing. For again, I'm sorry to, to, to belabor this point because I know it's perhaps a bit too specific, but for people who are following Badiou, you know that there is this duality that he criticizes, right? Between uh, what he calls the idealist aristocracy uh, of thinking that truths are outside of the world, they are something special and unique and uh, purely exceptional. And there is what he calls democratic materialism that treats humanity just as a sort of species of animals like every other species. And it's pretty much about preservation. We should preserve everyone because preservation is what we have in common. The sort of ultra naturalism of humanity. And he defines truth as the imbrication of a common exception. So it's interesting because in Bogdanov, every time you do something except to do something exceptional, you should take the standpoint that you're common, right? The standpoint where humanity advances is the standpoint where it sees itself most common to nature. So it's weird that the more the more you you are able to say how common you are, the more different you become, right? So. Uh, the more we thought we were different from nature in an absolute way, the less different we really were. The more you, the more the sort of naturalist organizational perspective kind of develops, the more actually exceptional you become, like the more you do something different, right? So there's a strange interplay between the common and the accept exceptional in his perspective, I think. I don't think it's simply naturalism in the sense that, oh, we're bound to do things because it's in our nature, because we're natural beings, and that's it. 
And it's also not humans are superior, we do things to dominate. It's like there is this logic where the deeper <laughs> you go into the way nature is organized, the more separate from nature you are. So the more the more you learn about nature, the more denaturalized you are. But this is a logic. This is not an essence. So if any other animal were to do this, they would go through some denaturalization process just like us. So it's both special in the sense that it's, you, it's, it's one thing, it's different from other things, but it's also not essential, I think. Another interesting place where this connects with Badu, and I, and I think it's really interesting in terms of what you're saying, Gabrielle, around like Bogdanov kind of proposing to replace philosophy with the organizational point of view is when he talks about the idea, which he defines as it always appears as an organizational scheme. This is on page three. And then he goes on to basically list three of the four conditions of truth. Um, he says technical rule, but he, de he describes it as coordinating the efforts of people in a direct and manifest fashion, scientific knowledge and artistic conception. And so he kind of brings the organizational view to the idea and links something like truth procedures at the top of page three. Ah, uh, yeah, it's true. I mean, I, I think that in my opinion, there is a, I mean, I don't want to like focus on this too much because it's not like everyone needs to be interested in Badiou, but I find it quite amazing that you can totally read Badiou's project under the same light. And I think that this is actually what distinguishes him very much from, from a lot of, of contemporary science, uh, philosophy, because you know, Badiou has this very strong idea that philosophy does not produce new truths, that philosophy needs to learn about what is true on other fields, and its only task is to systematize truths that are not philosophical, right? Uh, and he, he puts philosophy in a smaller place than other fields, that they are the inventive ones. For him, philosophy doesn't invent anything. It comes after, but in a way that is not even Hegelian, like things happen in politics and then philosophy says the truth about them. No, things happen in politics. Politics says what's truth about politics, and then philosophy needs to learn how politics does this stuff. Science does something. Science learns how to speak the truth about science, and then we learn about, about it afterwards. And in that way, it's very different, for example, from Deleuzean or uh, other philosophical procedures, contemporary, where philosophy helps everyone to be autonomous. Like, it's, it's the motivating force for creativity, it's connected to creativity. And I think that this role of philosophy in Badiou is very much like philosophy in the age of specialization. You cannot know beforehand what science will do. You cannot be up to date with all scientific endeavors. You cannot know beforehand what is political. You cannot know what art is gonna do. You can come afterwards and try to systematize what is compossible, right, between all those things. In that way, it's very similar, right, in this idea that, look, it's not, I, I, I see some connections. Uh, the first one is this idea that there is no total disorganization. That's Badiou's theory of the count as one, right? Every situation is structured. Then you have this idea that if you want to have a general point of view, something like a general ontology, it won't be an ontology of, relations, not, a, not an ontology of substance. It will be something like the theory of structures, right? Because what things, the most different things have in common is that they are structured. And the third point is that there is no content. This theory can not have one content because structures are so different. There are infinite ways this can happen that you the best you can do is come afterwards, right? So that point that Bogdanov makes about uh, communism can cannot be a modern system. The, the theory of knowledge in communism cannot be the theory of a unified system because there are infinite systems that are infinitely different. So it can only be a theory of 
the systematicity of systems, something like this, right? The theory of the most basic stuff that any system has to deal with without saying that they're all the same, right? So this is why for him, he says things like uh, on page 30, he says something like, it's very weird. He says, there is no essential difference between material and abstract instruments, right? Or, or structure, organization. And then later on, he will say, uh, talking about natural selection. Uh, oh, oh, I'm not sure if it's, this is where it is. But he talks about, okay, selection is perhaps a bit too general concept here. But he talks about, we shouldn't, we shouldn't, we don't need a theory of natural selection because there is a general theory of selection that, imply, that applies both to nature and to, to artificial systems. So it's a very kind of abstracted point of view that says only the things that are not relevant to, uh, this is not where it is. I don't know where it is. Uh, that all systems have in common, right? Yeah, but I, I, I can't really find the quote here. If I'm not mistaken, it's on part three. Gabriel, uh, yeah. just going back to the, to the drawing again, I remember uh, another meeting that, that you talked about the difference between the philosophical and economical manuscripts and capital. When you said that uh, in the first one, Marx went from the homogeneous elements to the heterogeneous elements. And in capital, he does the opposite in, in something similar uh, uh, from what you just did in the drawing, uh, saying that when you take the um, uh, the organizational point of view, you will reach you you will go to uh, from uh, like the, the the heterogeneous point of view from to a a common point of view that that is. Uh, when everybody is connected because everybody feels the resistance of trying to dominate uh, the natural forces. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking about the difference between this Bogdanov, Bogdanov's view and the view from capital, because what is common in capital? Uh, I, I think what is common is that we are connected because the same thing surpasses us. Mm -hmm. And I think here is, is another definition of common, better definition maybe, but I, I don't know. I don't no, know I, I find that very interesting because uh, I think, in my opinion is that I think Marx was had one of the most troubling moments in his life when he realized, I imagine, when he realized that his definition of the generic applies better to capital than to anything. Like the only place where he uses the same expression, like in, in the economic philosophical manuscripts, he talks about genericity as the capacity for people to do one thing and in doing that thing, change the very thing that is doing, right? Humans do things through labor but they change what it means to be human by doing those, those things. So it's kind of autopoietic, right? It's a feedback structure. The more you do something outward, it changes inward. But in capital, there's only one thing that has that feedback structure, which is self-valorization, right? Capital is kind of posits itself and then changes itself. 
Uh, so I wonder how sad it must have been to take your favorite concept from your youth and then apply it to capital <laughs> rather than to, you know, humanity. <laughs> it must have been very kind of ironic, sad moment for him. And uh, I think that uh, Dennis asked about capital in this chapter and you don't see any of it, right? And uh, I think that uh, you, the, from what I read in this book, I never read the whole thing, you, you get things like, how does capitalism appear from the organizational point of view? It will appear as at the level of epistemological, so organization of experience, it will be a specialized epistemology. You only know, you, you have such a restricted experience that you only know about a very small region of what is known, right? The field of the known is always bigger than what you know. You can never know, learn what humanity already knows, let's say. So there is a sort of uh, restriction at the level of experience. Uh, there is the issue of, at, a, at the level of production. There is the problem of uh, division of labor that he treats a lot. There is a lot about competition because, so from the organizational point of view, capital, capitals in the plural appear, appear as competition. So let's say it, it, it's almost treated as a form of social selection of organizations, right? It's something that Dennis was talking about the other day. Uh, and I think that if it's very fitting that for, for the concrete empirical, let's say, because it's funny, uh, uh, Bogdanov says the problem with philosophy is that it's not empirical. There are no philosophical experiments. And, he, or, and technology is different from philosophy because there are technological experiments. So it seems like he's an empiricist. But then he says, I'm no empiricist for the individual senses. It's not like the senses of our body are what makes something empirical because there are experiments that happen at the level of organizations or happen through scientific instruments. They don't happen through your perceptive organs, right? But it still is for him, competition is an empirical category for technology because if from the organizational point of view, you see organizations relating in ways that seem at first uh, to increase their efficiency and then to decrease uh, the way energy is distributed in society, things like this. So, uh, so, but it's weird because it's almost like there are no totalizing concepts. It's weird, like capitalism appears as we being poor in our capacity to know, uh, we being competitive and looking only very closely, like it's very kind of crappy at coordinating, right? It looks at its neighbor and tries to get the best out of it. And then you see in the long run that a crisis appears, right? But it's never like a big unified machinery. It's strange. And I think that sometimes this is good because uh, you see the idea that the organizational point of view sees more, right? It sees, it doesn't see like we are trapped in this system. It doesn't, never appears like that, but it's also perhaps not as good because financial capital and more abstract forms of capital might not appear so directly in this way. So the, probably there is more to do than simply stay at that level, right? Of analysis, but it's, but it's very strange how it emerges, I think. Yeah, and, and thinking about Dennis' question about uh, where is capital and thinking about what you just said, uh, when there is no totalization, how can you uh, talk about something like capital? Uh, yeah, I think that, I mean, I remember is... from, let me just see if I can find something here, because I remember in other texts, I mean, he wrote a lot about capital due to, to you know, his books on political economy and so on. Uh, so there, there are some references. Let's, let's just, why not just check them out very quickly. So for example, uh, in the part that we already wrote, read, so in this chapter, he says this, 
about when he's talking about machines, right? And about production. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing that I like, just before we get there, he says, let's see if we can find it. Actually, before we even talk about capital, um, I, I just realized that it, it it works just as well to say that the instruments of organization provide a theory of use value um, in the sense that even things that you consume for your own personal enjoyment can be thought of as organization of enjoyment, right? Instruments of organization of enjoyment, say, not to mention the production of other things being organizing nature or whatever, right? Yeah, so, I mean, it, you have that even like before you, you get to capital and this uh, more complex forms, organization can be thought, you know, even at this basic level of consuming things. I don't know how that fits with what yeah, I think, saying. I mean, in, in the part that it's not in this book, but I, I think I'll find the other version of it. I think Renzo has it. Uh, in the end of the technology book, the big one, there is an addendum called Organization and Labor, where his critique is exactly this, that capital uh, is incapable of connecting social reproduction and labor. He says, the only way to see the worker as an organization is to see the consumption and production as part of the same system. Like if you separate the worker between the worker as producer and then the worker as consume, consum, consumer, you actually divide one system into two, but then you won't be able to understand things about that system. So he makes a critique that the wage system uh, of payment connects uh, this, before it connects workers, it disconnects two parts of the worker system, right? So uh, uh, I think that it definitely goes together with what you're saying, Dennis. Like there is a there is an organizational point of view for consumption and and use and so on. And he even uses this to explain why, because for him there will be no division of labor will never end, right? It's, it's, it has a natural, it has a concrete reason. It's impossible to get the best out of work if people don't pay attention to one thing, at least for some time. And it's true that some works make you expend more energy than others. So it makes sense that some people need to eat more than others. For him, that's not a problem. Of course, everyone should eat what they need to, but the needs won't be homogenized. So he goes very far with the to each according to their needs from each according to their ability. But uh, so I think that there is a lot there. But for example, this example here, he talks about uh, industrial capitalistic system of production. Uh, and he talks about positive selection. Uh, so the industrial system under conditions of positive selection, prosperity, has certain definitive, definitive properties. These properties are sharply replaced by others with the approach of an industrial crisis and the sign of selection becomes negative. So he treats competition and, and uh, monopoly and uh, a bunch of economic categories as being the economic manifestation of a general principle that appears in other places like organization of ideas, organization of species and things like this. And it's always weird how it needs to be similar, right? Uh, because there is something in common from the organization point of view, but it's never the same. It's always different because there's something specific about economy that is different from the relation between species, right? Uh, so there, there's actually a lot of references to capital. Uh, let's see if we can find some like more. Yeah, 
Yeah, I know that uh, another thing, I think I, I know that he has a very polemic explanation of World War I. He was the, one of the first guys in Soviet uh, uh, politics to explain it like Hilferding by putting financial capital in like the front point, you know? So, I mean, he's not very vulgar in his political economy. He was actually quite sophisticated. So it's weird that when he's talking about technology, that's not in the forefront. Like, it's really not the same as economy. I think that's also why it's not so, so, uh, so in the center, you know? I just wanted to find, there's a really cool quote. You think part of that is, is polemical like you're saying that this was written in a time of revolution like trying to dislocate the constant centralizing of theory during the soviet era on economics and really trying to like pull organization outside of starting with economics always yeah i have that impression because uh i mean they're from two from because of, from two perspectives, like first, because there was even be, amongst other Soviet thinkers, the idea that they had new problems, right? Like Probachevsky was writing on socialist economy. They were trying to think the problems ahead in the best sense, like being very optimistic. What will we face in a new society? There were many people thinking about that. And I think that that justified focusing somewhere else. But I also think that he was very, very committed to this idea that, uh, I mean, I, I wanted to find a quote. I know that there is a, a not so amazing version of it in the beginning, uh, but there is one later on that is better. But he's talking about, I think on page 20 something, he's talking about specialization of labor, right? Uh, and he says, how geometry appeared. Ge he, he explained mathematics precisely as a sort of, and I mean, we can take this very far, man, because uh, he gives a, a, a theory of the birth of mathematics out of the generalization from specific practical situations, right? You measure with some land here, you measure something else there, suddenly you start developing by looking at what they have in common, a theory of measurement in general. Right. But if you look at the history of mathematics, which is very much a complex mixture of algebra and geometry all the time. Right. Uh, today, category theory was kind of created to be the most sophisticated theory of how to import structures from one part of mathematics to another. Right. It is all about isomorphisms and it's a kind of Though it's not meant to be only this, but it also is a generalization from model theory, it seems to me, right? Of how do you stop focusing on how one thing models another and you get a general theory of how to encode information from one system into another system and only focus on the encoding and let go of the inferior description. That's the sort of technology for generalizing structure in mathematics. So it's very, very, it has a very similar flavor uh, to this first move, first moment, which was, let's say, coming up with mathematical realm or geometrical realm out of the generalization of specific situations. But then once you have geometry and as a separate branch, it itself specializes into parts of geometry that don't really go together, like algebraic geometry. Uh, Euclidean geometry and non-Euclidean geometry and all these things. And then you, again, need some other form of finding what is common about all those special, specialized versions, right? Uh, the thing that I wanted to find here that I think is useful is that he says this, right? Uh, so he just described this specification of the world, this sort of tension between bourgeois ideology of uh, uh, generalization, no, bourgeois ideology of specialization 
and popular kind of culture of generalization, right? So for him, capitalist world is kind of divided, or early capitalism, late feudalism or whatever, it's kind of divided between these two things. The increasing specificity in the cities, increasing, increasing specificity in professions, being an artisan of a specific thing, learning to do one thing, one trade, and a sort of popular uh, technology, as he talked, right? Popular sayings, superstitions, everything that connects everyone together. And then he talks about the limit of specialization, so which is kind of talking about the limit of division of labor, right? So specialization has led to tremendous development of the collective forces of mankind in labor in cognition. It had, however, a limited motive power for progress. Along with conditions facilitating and accelerating progress, specialization also contains retarding conditions. At first, their impact was negligible, but in the course of time, this impact has grown to such an extent that now it is being converted into the present deep contradiction, which costs mankind so dearly. The benefit of specialization comes from economy of efforts. You learn to do things spending less energy, right? The worker doesn't scatter them in various directions, but concentrates them. Uh, so because the field of organization experience is narrower, you only experience less. Mastery over it becomes easier. Uh, the acquisition of skills and methods becomes faster. Nevertheless, along with the economy of effort comes their dissipation, which is at first imperceptible but inescapable from the very beginning. It flows from the weakening of bonds amongst people and the connectedness of their experience. Uh, and then he starts talking about the sort of problem of specialization, which makes capitalist division of labor actually a crappy way of doing this, right? Uh, and then he talks about how language is changed under specialization and, and uh, the impossibility of transferring methods from one place of the other because it's too complex and it's too separate and there's nothing in common, right? So it's a nice way of framing a problem of capitalism in as if it's like just a problem in the world. Like it's just one thing. It does very good one part of the operation and very badly the other one. It specializes a lot, increases complexity, but is not capable of transmitting the information of the complexity that it itself created, right? So nothing gets transformed, no, nothing gets passed along. So I, I just like this because I think it goes, John, to what you were saying, this sort of way of showing capitalism as a specific thing rather than the general condition. And just saying, like, until now, this was done in this way, right? But the problem is the background problem. It's not a capitalist problem. That's, I think that ultimately this is what makes Bogdanov so interesting, is that the problems are problems of man with nature. Capitalism is a solution to a problem that is bigger than capitalism. And it's a kind of crappy solution when seen from that perspective. Like, so you're not trying to solve capitalism's problem. You're trying to solve the problems of man's relation to nature better than capitalism, right? So I think that that's very different. Like, uh, this right? is very similar. This is very similar from Apolito's problem too. Yes, totally. Yeah. Right, so I, I would say something like you have this sort of uh, nature here and society here and nature is defining society but at the same time there is some connection and this is a big problem and then you have one solution which is capitalism. And it does some things good, some things bad, but it's not like you're trying to say like inequality is here and you're trying to solve it with communism, right? Communism goes here. So it's not determined by capitalist social relations, it's determined by this other thing here. And I think that that's kind of like the point of view change, right? You're not really, you're, there is the point of politics. And I think that that's also, uh, uh, it's also strange to think of it in this way because 
socialist politics is so defined by correcting the mistakes of a social system that it's very, even at its best, it's very reactive, right? Like the world is like this, I'm solving, I'm, I'm making capitalism accountable. I'm making, it's a dialogue with capital, with capital. And I think that for Bogdanov and this sort of idea that society is, is almost like a adventure within nature, right? You're doing something in, that can go wrong in nature and it, how, to, how to go about it. It makes politics more affirmative, like who will solve this better, right? Rather than how do I make up for the mistakes of the past? It's, it's a slightly different approach. I think it has more, it's more enthusiastic in a certain sense, I think, you know? Uh, and I think it also avoids very nicely this sort of, you know, even though he's a conservative, I think sometimes he captures very well this idea. You know that Peter Sloterdijk guy, he wrote this book called The uh, Rage in Time. I don't know how it's called in Portuguese, O Banco da Ira, the, like the deposit of rage. And he, his theory is that it's very left, very hard for the left to imagine a reason to do politics that is not rage. But it's not making like the critique of, oh, you guys are so aggressive. It's slightly different. He, his point is that, and he's a quite conservative, so he's kind of making, a, making it kind of a very mean sort of approach. But his idea is that this, this is an economy. Rage has an, because of what Nietzsche said about resentment, resentment has an economical dimension. And you guys will only be able to go as far as resentment allows. Like the moment that resentment is not economically viable, like it doesn't pay to do things because you're either like revenging yourself or, or getting back, there will be no stamina to do things. And I think that Bogdanov is a good counter part to this, you know, it's, it's, there is not much place for resentment, like there is a sort of uh, almost a, a view that capitalism, it's always like this point, like it's, yeah, it was okay, but it's not all that, you know, it's like, it's not the best thing, it's not so good, you know, it's a st strange perspective, I think. I think perhaps, I think that might explain a bit why he doesn't really, he's not so attached to the Soviet praise of the industrial worker and he had better ties with the peasants and so on and a sort of change of sensibility because it's not really kind of let's revenge everything that was taken from us it's it has a different feel to it i don't know it's kind of more more important to him to create the terrain that you were talking about than yeah i think he's more like that and i find it so beautiful that he i mean it's totally tragic and comical effort really that the guy died doing blood transfusion <laughs> with people it's yeah uh, yeah he really believed in the homogeneity <laughs> principle <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah so so uh, it's crazy, yeah. But I, I don't know. From this chapter, there are some things we, I mean, we can, as we move along, we can also talk. I mean, for people who are following the, this whole philosophy, the deba philosophical debate on correlationism and Quentin Meyasu's critique of the subject object relation, it's quite amazing that he makes a critique of Kant based on that and a critique of analytic philosophy before it was born. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw this, like he, he said that there are two, two big theories mm. on, on, on part five, contemporary thought and the idea of general unit of organizational method, right? And he talks about Kantian philosophy uh, as a sort of uh, subjectivism that doesn't accept structure in the world. In, so it doesn't accept objective structure as a given, even though it depends on it. So he makes a critique of it. And then he makes a critique of philological and symbolical philosophy. 
right? The idea that language is the thing that actually determines structure as well. So it's it's very contemporary, the debate, like trying to justify why organization is not the same as transcendental categories of thought. We organize things with our mind, and it's also not language that gives organization, because if the organization is not there, language cannot uh, do anything about it. And, and it's funny that in that point, he's criticizing Poincaré, like his his reference is Poincaré, it's not like some some small guy. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, you can find a lot of crazy things in this like first chapter. He, he anticipates Turing. I think he also kind of anticipates Chomsky with like grant, like pretty much like a universal grammar, right? Based on- Yeah, there is some <laughs> universal grammar. <laughs> of organization, yeah. So uh, it's he, like everything. He wrote, uh, there is this, the, the part on primitive words, it's like exactly what Freud was doing like two years before. There is an actual text by Freud, Freud dealing with exactly the same thing, reading a, a anthropologist of language that was friends with the guy that Bogdanov quoted. Like they were, he was very much in the know of the moment. It's very different from, from Lenin, in fact. I mean, I love Lenin, but imperial, imperial criticism is kind of embarrassing. Like, not to say, not to say totally embarrassing. Uh, and, and also Bogdanov was reading like Einstein in the year that the, his first papers were published that uh, relativity and so on. He was, he was really keeping up to date, you know. Uh, one thing that we, I think we will have to talk about later on, but I think we can wait a bit, is that the, the main guy behind Bogdanov's approach is Ernst Mach, right? The, the scientist and philosopher of science who had that opposed Newton on the idea that time and space are, are kind of absolute coordinate systems, right? Uh, which ultimately influenced Einstein as well, right? It's apparently it's very arguable how much Einstein was in, actually influenced by Mach or if it's just like a retroactive thing. He said, ah, that guy also thought something in this direction. But it's very interesting to see that there is a very strong influence of a sort of relativism in, in Bogdanov, right? Uh, what counts as matter, what counts as form, what counts as agency, what counts as resistance, it's all relative to the organization that is being analyzed. Like you can have things that look totally different from two perspectives, like one organization from the perspective of humans, we're walking on inert ground. But if you look at a different scale, there is a lot of transformation going and there is no such thing as stable inert stuff. So it's very uh, connected as well, the idea of organization and the idea of reference frame. Uh, and I think that it would be worth at some point as we move to perhaps just stop a bit and talk about Ernst Mach and uh, Richard Avenarius, who was another philosopher he quoted a lot, because they were very relevant to this sort of uh, I think the way that organization came to the fore, because his critique of Kant has a lot to do with that, right? There is no general transcendental structure because transcendental structures are in history and they're being changed because they're just forms of organizing experience, right? Uh, that change is similar to what Mach does to Newton in saying that these things are not absolute frames. The, ap the actual measurement of time and measurement of space is part of what constructs the concept of time and space depending on how measurements are made and the way that we can construct experiments and so on. So. Uh, there is a sort of relativization of what counts as transcendental for a given situation. So, uh, and it's very nice to see that there is a connection both with what was happening in physics and what he was proposing. And I think ultimately this is why he will choose to focus on organization rather than labor. Labor implies a sort of, labor is a very Newtonian concept to begin with, right? And 
organization is already is already a bit more complicated because you let's say if there is work or if the general tendency is entropic actually becomes more interactional than substantial right uh, because for example you can have a very complicated system where parts of it are going against entropy but globally it's actually entropic uh things get much more kind of uh localized i think so i think that there is a nice story to be told about the sort of change in, in the way physics was being thought change in the way that he moves from work to organization and also change in the sort of slightly different view of experience and its connection to experimentation against the sort of transcendental view of experience right uh i think that's all kind of in the background of what we're reading but i think it will become clearer later on uh hopefully <laughs> but if you guys have some uh some suggestion on what to read about math please uh, uh, i i have a couple of things i'll send you guys so I'll... okay it's really really amazing the guy was people hated him apparently but it's very apparently he was a very annoying person but uh i'll, I'll send you guys some some links okay great yeah great i was heard of this guy but i never read him uh, i'll send you guys there is uh there is something that ultimately was called the math principle that actually is einstein's terminology for it so einstein did give the guy a lot of credit but we'll see i'll send you guys some stuff let me know what you yeah. think great well, guys yeah uh, take care of all yeah y'all have a good night or day good night a good day for you john <laughs> yeah good day, <laughs> good day yeah <laughs> see ya all right bye -bye. take care all right night